Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be sh starting shortly. Um, so good afternoon. Thank you for joining Datacon, 20, uh, Datacon LA 2022. Welcome to AI, ML, and uh, data science. My name is Salman, your co-host, and our co-hosts are, are behind there waiting there for any help, assistance. Please be mindful of our COVID regulations. We recommend you wear your masks, but given the room is pretty empty right now, it's okay if you do not feel comfortable with, with them. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask us any questions. We are here to help you. And today is my kind pleasure to introduce Mr. Russell Journey. Uh, he will be talking about open source large knowledge graph uh, factory. Mr. Russell works at an intersection of national natural language processing, NLP, and graph neural networks. He is a four-time O'Reilly author and proven leader of teams that build, ship, and operate AI applications. He has extensive experience in all aspects of data science, data engineering, machine learning, and ML operation that are part of building data-driven applications. He is an applied researcher and product manager with a broad range of skills from 14 years of experience building and shipping data-driven products. He's currently interested in representation learning, graph neural networks, algorithmic tra trading, and source code search and, and Q&A, but is open to other opportunities. He is a former LinkedIn Hawthorne Works. He is a founder and startup CTO. He has founder and startup CTO experiences. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to him. Thank you. You can use the mic. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I should have written a bio instead of uh, reading my LinkedIn profile, which is very commercial. Um, my name is Russell Journey. Thank you for coming to the talk. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, a project that myself and some associates have started uh, called Graphlet AI. It's an Apache 2.0 licensed um, uh, knowledge graph factory. Um, uh, it's new, and so there aren't like a ton of you know amazing things it does to, uh, to to sort of show you. It's early, so what the talk mostly covers is uh, the process of building enterprise knowledge graphs, uh, working with large data sets, and building large knowledge graphs. Uh, the problems you run into, and um, sort of what solutions to them might look like. Um, and so uh, the first thing we needed was like a logo because uh, you can't have like an open source project without a logo. So we knocked that out and then got a GitHub repo. Um, so some helpful hints. Um, there's like a lot of slides here. I wanted to create something that people could reference to, to learn more about. And so if you'd like to read slides, like as you go, like the content, you're, you know, I'm probably gonna go quicker than, than you can sort of cover everything. Um, but the, there are this URL, it's just graphlet underscore AI underscore slides at bit.ly. And uh, you can uh, check them out and follow along. Um, and so uh, the talk covers sort of, you know, who do I think I am talking about the topic, a, a brief introduction about kind of how uh, I came to start the project, um, cover the semantic web and the approach that a lot of the tools in the enterprise space for knowledge graphs, uh, the perspective they come from. Um, we're going to talk about why enterprise knowledge graphs can you know often cost seven or even eight figures and and sort of often don't provide a return uh you know of investment um there are a lot of problems that people encounter and then uh, we're going to talk about what solutions might look like and, and kind of what we're working on so a personal history of knowledge graphs this uh was like me at my thinnest when i fit into a new wetsuit it's like my favorite photograph ever um about me, uh, I dropped out of the biology program at Georgia State University to get into QA automation. Uh, there was a web project for dashboards I didn't get, so I quit to start a company to do that for travel casinos uh, and uh, learn web development. Did that for a while, got more into visualization, built a graphical user interface for uh, Hadoop, uh, just a prototype, and that was enough to get hired uh, in early big data days in Silicon Valley. Uh, went to LinkedIn to learn machine learning products, uh, developed the graph obsession along the way. And uh, along with my uh, associate, Mike, uh, we, we ended up sort of playing Batman, going after financial criminals uh, at my last job. So I uh, co-founded a company called Deep Discovery. Uh, we had uh, ultimately a $3 billion entity uh, you know, economic graph of uh, the, the global economy. Um, 
We use Spark and Python to refine the graph down to uh, about 600 million identities. I'll talk about that terminology. It's hard to talk about like uh, this entity is a group of other entities and the master entity. And so we came up with entity being like a raw thing and an identity being like the resolved identity. Um, and we came up with a risk score and we explained it with network visualization along the way. Um, the team became a little bit very interested in network motifs, which are like statistically significant patterns in a graph that are very powerful. Uh, so I got into graphs because I was an unsuccessful entrepreneur in Atlanta. And I read about these guys, the traitorous eight that started Fairchild Semiconductor. William Shockley invented the transistor or co-invented it and was a really difficult guy to get along with, lost his mind midlife and, and sort of faded into obscurity. But uh, these guys were really talented that he assembled. They started Silicon Valley, essentially. Uh, Fairchild Camera gave them a lot of equity in the company. And so it was successful. And then they went out and started, it starts from the left, all of these companies. And this ultimately snowballed into the entire Silicon Valley ecosystem where venture capital spawns continuously new companies. And so I looked at this and was like, man, we need this in Atlanta where I was from. And I, there was this, I was really into network security as a script kitty uh, as a teenager. And I knew people in security. And so um, I built this map. This is my first like network project where uh, uh, the nodes are companies and the edges are, it should be directional, but it was my first graph. What can I say? Um, it's when you worked at one company, learned how to do startups and then went and founded another company. And so the idea here is that there was this one company, Internet Security Systems, and um, they resulted in a ton of other companies. There's another one, Secure IT, that sold their stuff. And this actually grew and grew and grew, and now Atlanta is one of the top security towns in the world. The point of this project was to convince the state and the city to kind of subsidize that industry, which wanted to grow, rather than sort of chasing the film industry. Uh, I was really successful at that. Didn't understand much about government, but it was a good learning experience. This was the newspaper version. Uh, then I went to uh, Ning and did uh, graph analysis for um, figuring out like why people stopped signing up, essentially. Uh, and so uh, I got really into them because it worked. And um, I went to LinkedIn, uh, a product managed and led development of a project called LinkedIn InMaps, where you could visualize your own LinkedIn network. Uh, the cool part was that um, we didn't label the clusters. We let you do it because... I let my brother label his with a marker and he needed to own it because it told the, the story of his career. So we just let the user do it. Uh, it took like three years to get something on the LinkedIn website at that point. So we just did it on other platforms through virality. It's kind of a hack to, for the IPO kind of um, press. Uh, I played around with inbox networks for a while. This is my inbox on the left. On the right is my inbox with my brother's inbox, kind of the overlap. Um, then I started a company called Relato. We collected uh, partnerships, example customers. We got competitors from AdWords, created a business graph and uh, analyzed it. I'm gonna talk about this poster later. Um, and then uh, this was kind of one of the, the you could look at your market segments and like what the competitor's penetration was. It turned out not to be a great product. It's like a service, but it was a good learning opportunity. This is what we built at uh, Deep Discovery. This is a guy called Ivo Zudis. Uh, he comes up clean in all the other systems that we tested when he applies for a bank account. So he does business on behalf of this gentleman uh, in the explosion. This is Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, in some circles, he's America's most wanted man. He uh, rigged the election for Putin by running the Internet Research Agency. Uh, this guy, Ivo Zudis, on the right, uh, owns uh, this guy's murder plane, uh, VS, I forget the tail number. Um, there, this was based on a, a, an article from the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, and we extended what they knew looking at our data. And it turns out this guy has an airplane, and it's known that he does this, but like he's so wealthy and powerful, he'll go from place to place globally, and he'll have talks about a topic, and then he'll leave, and then several people associated with that topic wind up dead. And it happens over and over, and the FSB is killing people on behalf of him and President Putin. And, and this airplane is known, it just continues. And, and so this is starting to change with the invasion of Ukraine, but these guys uh, were very, very um, openly engaging in these kinds of activities. And so we went after the middlemen, the, the, the Ivo Zudis is, I think in Wolf on Wall Street, that you know, it's called a rat hole. It's like his mother-in-law that has the money. So this is actually how, if you're sanctioned by OFAC, the Treasury Department, you know, you don't own your own assets. You have guys that work for you that you'll kill if they don't give you the money. 
and, and they do your banking on your behalf. So that was the goal. Um, unfortunately, uh, rather than IPOing, uh, you know, the company uh, didn't. And so uh, in the end, you know, we needed to figure out a new plan. Uh, we're all very passionate about networks and we had a bunch of challenges. And, and, and I personally was just like, you know, what, what do I do next? Like, I'm very passionate about building knowledge graphs. We ran into a bunch of problems. Uh, we know how to solve them. How do we take what we learn and kind of apply it to help everyone? Uh, by the way, that mountain was painted by Nicholas Rorich. So if you're a startup founder, watch out for him. He occupies the early 20th century. I'm sorry, I'm a huge fan. I just had to promote his work. Um, so we wanted to take what we learned and solve it for all. Uh, so uh, this is the project that we're working on. Um, this talk contains strong opinions. Uh, I'm not a big fan of RDF and, and some people like it and Sparkle. Um, so there's other ways to do everything that I'm going to talk about. It's a, it's a strong perspective, but uh, if you think it's sort of wrong because you like another approach, it's, it's quite possibly the case. It's influenced by uh, kind of what I've done and what use cases I've tackled. Um, there's two approaches to building a knowledge graph. One is kind of you know doing ETL on a bunch of different data sets. This is common in an enterprise when they try to bring all their databases together. The other approach is like information extraction and then entity linking into a graph. Um, that is a topic of its own. So I'm going to focus on combining different data sets. There's a great tutorial uh, if you go to the slides on getting started with information extraction. So to, to talk about knowledge graphs, you know, enterprise knowledge graphs, we're talking about like a business problem. So um, for starters, knowledge graphs are really, really hot right now. Um, they're at the top of the peak of inflated expectations. And so, you know, people are spending uh, seven or eight figures, which is a million to 10 million dollars on these things at enterprises and often that they're sort of not getting return on investment yet and so uh there's inevitably coming the trough of disillusionment and um that's kind of where the market is at and so it's important that use cases drive everything when you build an enterprise knowledge graph if you have a vision of like we're going to build a unified ontology of all our information and that's kind of why you're doing it or you're like we're going to make recommendations by bringing all our data together it's not really specific enough, and those projects tend to um, spend a lot of time organizing information and not as much getting use out of it. And so, you know, a good use case is like, I want to recommend Git repositories to users based on other repositories they like, rank order them, and then build a graph that can satisfy those use cases. Um, you need to create a data set priority list that you're going to ingest. It tends to change as you go on. Um, focus on fast wins because when you're working with large data sets, uh, you know, this can, can be expensive. You need to, to, to earn your keep, so to speak. Um, so you need to evaluate the data sets that are available for your graph. There's lots of free data that's available that's really excellent. Um, scraping data at scale is costly. So you can often license data sets. Like if you want LinkedIn, you can go to Bright Data. They've crawled it. Um, it's, you know, something, the range of five figures, which you would spend in trouble getting that whole data set. And so you have to, um, try to license data from data providers. Uh, we were very good at um, cutting development deals with companies. And so, uh, you know, a data set might cost millions of dollars, but you could get a development license, you know, for three months, six months, a year to build your product. And then ultimately you start paying for the data. And so you can talk to a data broker if you're working in this area and they can kind of guide you on how to do that. It, it, it's a skill, but um, you can acquire data sets that way. A few larger data sets is better if you're building, you know, just generally speaking. Uh, there's a lot of ETL complexity costs in um, dealing with a lot of small data sets. Uh, there's a scaling cost as well, but um, kind of doing it once for a larger data set, if you get a lot more no density and important nodes and edges, uh, it's a little bit more efficient. Um, you know, if you're doing information extraction, which we don't cover a lot, but you, know, you need to think through like, uh, it's easy to do, you know, kind of badly and hard to do in a refined way that you would make a business decision on. Uh, maybe you don't need a knowledge graph. Like I said, they're hot. And so make sure that there's a really legitimate use case and purpose to your project. A lot of times, uh, you know, there are, there are tools like Graphistry where you can take a relational database and like query it and get a graph out of it. And they don't do anything at the storage layer. They're just able to work with them implicitly. And so a lot of people do graph processing where they'll just run queries and then get the data in tabular form and, and do their work like if they're using machine learning. You should definitely consider that. Um, and so don't just assume it's essential. Um, there's an industry around this stuff. And so sometimes that can happen. 
Um, think about the data sets for your knowledge graph. Like what kind of data is it? Is it a relational database? Is it semi-structured data, JSON data, that sort of thing? Um, sometimes you start with an existing network. That's uh, We started out with data that had to be ETL'd uh, into a graph, and then we acquired a data set that was a large knowledge graph, and, and we ended up using that as the backbone. Uh, so if you can acquire network data and kind of build your graph onto it, that's great. Um, and then in terms of text, if you're doing information extraction, rather than going for the whole enchilada, you need to focus on like one entity at a time, one relationship at a time, and get those into production uh, and rather than kind of going after everything. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, you're sort of looking for a node edge list of, of type semi-structured records. Uh, where did your data come from? Sometimes when you license data or it's provided in a database, you lack context of where it came from and, and you don't have the ability to fix issues in it because you don't understand it well enough. So that's important. Uh, how clean is your data? If it's dirty, if it came from humans and forms, there's a high ETL cost, a high cleaning cost. Um, if it came from a machine, uh, like uh, network security data, there, there can be less of one. Um, you know, do you have the, like I said, the context? Um, and sometimes can you fix an upstream process or feed where the data is coming from uh, or you cut off from it? Um, how uniform is it? You know, like how many types of entities? If there are a thousand, there's going to be a great, you know, a higher cost than uh, 10. And so that's really important. How many data sets are you going to ingest? Um, how varied are the schemas? A lot of times you'll get data sets that you have to extract multiple entities from. And that's not certainly not bad. That's kind of the beauty of building a graph. But you need to be aware of what the semantic differences are. So you have to put a lot of thought into kind of how you're going to go from the source representation to your ontology. Um, so scale can slow things down. Um, you know, edge count tends to hurt more than um, node count. And uh, most graph operations are CPU bound, not I.O. bound. And the degree distribution is critical. Um, we're going to talk about super nodes that make things very difficult. Um, what are your node and edge properties? What data types are they? Uh, you often need to summarize records. Like if you combine records through entity resolution, you got 10 addresses. You, you, know, you often need to merge those into only the unique records. Uh, you can use representation learning like embeddings to represent records, compare them. Uh, you need to think of your graph as a sample, even if you feel like you have all the data. If you think through it, you probably don't. Uh, the data you have might not be representative and that can impact the decisions you make based on it. Um, what entity resolution do you need? We're going to talk about this more, but often if you don't do entity resolution, you can't find the patterns you're looking for in your graph. And you need to think about like how bad is it if you merge nodes that should be separate and how bad is it if you don't merge them and, and, and for which entities and what's the business tolerance for each? Um, how do you, do you need to track lineage very carefully? Is it essential that you have like a full legal custody chain back to the original data? For us, that was fairly important to be able to demonstrate, you know, when someone's filing like a suspicious activity report, you know, this data came from this source and this is the basis for this suspicion. It was, it was, it was heavy, um, but most domains are not as bad as financial compliance. There's this concept of graph intelligence that um, Graphistry and uh, Ben Lorica have been promoting that's sort of, you know, it's not about a graph database. It's about the, the open, you know, Python and R stacks and kind of processing graphs uh, you know, on top of other technologies that deal with storage. The um, background of this, the, the tools that are very really popular in enterprise come from the semantic web. The vision here was an academic vision of everyone having their own small knowledge graph. And, and you would easily combine like many of them and you would do these like graph queries. You get like artificial general intelligence out of it. It was going to be like a paradise. The reality was uh, documented by Cory Doctorow, the science fiction uh, fantasy writer. Um, Data, you know, other people's data you don't trust. It's ugly. Uh, they have different concepts than you have in your domain. Um, you know, ETL of, of, of a thousand data sets from every little website is cost prohibitive, especially if you do it uh, at query time, you know, via like Sparkle where there's no common schema. Um, and so uh, the tools that developed were kind of like a schema default system where everything became property based instead of object based, which created its own uh, set of issues. Um, and so the reality is, uh, unfortunately, that there's like a moat around each organization. You bring your own knowledge graph. There are a few large ontologies that are shared and um, you, know, you, you can pull from them. Uh, you might have structured or semi-structured data. You might do information extraction. You build your own uh, knowledge graph. It's kind of your data moat because it unifies the information across your organization. Uh, this is what I was talking about. They tend to be expensive and very dear. 
Uh, they tend not to be shared except commercially. Um, obviously, large organizations, Wikidata is very useful. Google's Knowledge Graph, DiffBot is commercial. It's very good. The problem with these is that they're not panaceas because they either don't have the coverage you need for your application or they don't have the accuracy in that area. And so they're useful, but they're not like a, a total solution. On the left, you have uh, RDF triple stores. Um, and on the right, you have like the object version. And so um, that is kind of uh, the, the approach here is property graphs as opposed to RDF. Um, here are some comparisons between the two. I'll just say that we take a property graph perspective. Um, and um, so, all right, working with property graphs, this is kind of the architecture. This is a standard sort of big data architecture where you process and ingest data, refine it, build what you kind of want to see, and then publish it in a, uh, you know, like a database uh, search engine. Uh, we ended up building a graph database on top of a search engine. That's a really common thing to do. Um, other, you know, databases, TigerGraph or Neo4j could be used. Then you sort of serve the data out into an API. Um, so building ontologies, oops, it's displaying wrong. Um, basically, uh, the approach is to transform data sets into a common uh, ontology, a common schema, rather than sort of trying to do it at the property level. Um, uh, sometimes a lot of ETL isn't necessary if you're dealing with machine generated data. Here's an example of having like a source graph of Stack Overflow uh, questions, users, posts. Here's medium posts. It's important to get this data if you want to recommend both together into a common form. And so you might do a forums thing and, and sort of wrangle them into a common schema. Uh, this is a lot of what you do if you're building large knowledge graphs. Um, super nodes come up. They're nodes with like a lot of connections. They break things. If you have a million degree node and you want to count how many of its neighbors are connected, the complexity is a million times a million over two. You can see how this gets completely out of hand. So you have to deal with them. You essentially deal with them by filtering them, creating a blacklist, deleting them, coming up with a threshold beyond which you do not walk. There's another approach that's more sophisticated called role discovery, where you look at the structure of the, the area around that node and you come up with the role. So in this, I did this for a poster. The blue nodes were like people that, this is a partnership graph. The big companies are in green, the, the kind of up and comers are in red and the insignificant nodes that have a few partnerships are in blue. I ended up deleting them to get this poster. Um, so that's kind of the more sophisticated side. Entity resolution, you figure out what uh, things are the same and which aren't. This is the entity identity terminology I, I mentioned. Um, uh, but basically, uh, once you resolve it, you've got kind of a definitive record, but you might have lists of things that came to form that record. So in this case, there, uh, you know, you can translate things where there's multiple values toward for one field. You have to get comfortable uh, with that, um, you know, and so uh, that's a, a something you have to address. And so the process you go through is sort of you start out with bronze tables is, is the the data rex terminology i like the concept it's not an architecture but uh, it's just the raw data tables you transform them here into like a uniform schema in silver tables um, at that point uh, you need to perform entity resolution uh, you can't compare every record in the data with every other record because that's in squared complexity uh, and so um, you have to create smaller groups that's what blocking is you might do it on last name that sort of thing that's a traditional approach uh, you know, so here oh, we'll do it on just the name of the user on GitHub or the other platform. You can do manual matching and you create like links between them and then you use connected components to combine those. Uh, and so we came up on an approach where we use pre-trained language models from a paper uh, that was a landmark paper that has code on GitHub. We built a system on top of this and this is the architecture, but the trick is it's a language model, but it's seen all sorts of data on the web that um, is structured. And so you tell it literally in text, this is a column name, you know, and it's like, oh, it's, it's the name, and this is the value, it's Apple Incorporated. So you've got a text document, it's a half, but language models have developed so quickly that this actually works as a general form of representation for graph nodes. And so you encode it that way, and then you treat it as a, uh, you know, you compare the two records and, and classify them as match or not. Um, so. Uh, what they do in the paper, there's an algorithm called the, the library called Senex Transformers. They just encode that text representation into a fixed link vector. That's what this is. And it's an uh, you know, old algorithm called locality sensitive hashing that they perform. It, you know, on a, a, a distance, it groups like nodes into buckets. 
And uh, then you just compare them all within a bucket, your settings to decide how big they are. And that's how you block. It's much easier than coming up with many manual strategies like last name, first initial, you know, like uh, county, county last name. Like you might have to do that a hundred times traditionally. You can use sentence transformers on fields or documents to um, compare things. We did this with uh, officers of companies, uh, you know, like there were Gazprom companies, uh, 1,100 known to the Treasury Department because they're official. We found 30,000, and uh, we did an analysis where we would look at like how similar the officer names were in a fuzzy manner with all these companies to demonstrate that you know that's actually how many need to be sanctioned. Uh, the, there's an architecture that comes with this. Uh, I linked to see matcher.py. Those are links. You can actually just take this off the shelf and use it. That's why I'm talking about it. We're building an architecture on top of it as part of the library. Uh, you need to consider network context as well. You can do that by just listing, for example, for a company, the officers that are, that are there. Uh, you can use graph neural networks. The reason you do entity resolution, if you're doing a, like a graph query on the property one of you know, person A1, and then you're trying to also look at property one of, of an international person B2, if they're not connected by this friendship link, you have no idea that they're friends. Whereas if you resolve them into identities, um, you know, you, you get the pattern. And it's interesting, we actually saw a 1 million times increase in matches for the pattern I'm going to show you in a second after doing entity resolution. Um, which uh, Mike led that effort uh, over in the audience. And, um, but uh, so network motifs are statistically significant patterns. Uh, they come from graphlets. These are like patterns in a graph. They, they have orbits. Those are the numbers on the rolls and they're statistically significant patterns. So uh, they occur more than random. Um, they're really, really powerful because uh, if, they, if something occurs more than random and is structural, you should probably take note of it. Um, this is the first paper that did network motifs and genetics. Um, you know, it shows sort of uh, there was connections that were significant in like a, you know, a protein transcription network. Uh, there's a problem uh, searching for these in like property graphs. You can see there's three paths, you know, three nodes and three types and it's that many uh, nodes. This talks about, you know, it gets even worse once you have uh, properties. Uh, so, you know, so here you have like what if all the properties are variants too? Suddenly you can't search for them. This is a problem that we're tackling via um, subgraphs, vector search. You use a graph neural network and, and train it so that you can uh, look for motifs in a bigger graph in an approximate way. This is how you search for uh, motifs in uh, graph frames, a, a platform on top of Spark. You define the pattern. Here you're sort of doing a root by to count like, uh, you know, how many, uh, ownership percentages there are among the companies. Here's the pattern. It's called multiple path indirect ownership. Company A is a legitimate company or person. Company C, you know, has blood money associated with it. Uh, they own a bunch of companies with a majority share, they have a minority share, and it adds up. Uh, and so this is a common pattern. This is from Bureau Van Dyke. This is a pattern that we found. Um, the person at the top uh, corrupted, imagine like legal zoom, but smaller uh, corporate corporation services company. And they had a bunch of companies they formed, and that clue would just came from another place that, that that person was associated with laundering. But a lot of these names overlap, and so that became a generic motif that we searched for to uncover suspicious activity in a network. And you can do this for your own problem domain. And what you end up doing is combining these things. So you could take this pattern and roll it up so that you combine all the nodes and edges coming out of all these nodes. Now you've got this like laundering network node. Now what does it connect to? So you've transformed it from the, the problem space into the solution space. So you're working on forming like a risk level graph. The other interesting thing is that each one of these layers, orbit one is like the person in control, orbit two is a, a layer of indirection, it's a structural role, orbit three are the people that are working you know, with person A to be kind of the officers in the company, some of them are real, some of them fake. You can also roll these up across into one node, and these up across by roll. Now you've got something really interesting, which is like, what's the behavioral pattern in the network, and how do those interact? And if you do this, and you look at like how these things combine, but maybe this links out to another node, and it's a different pattern. Well, if you've got several suspicious patterns that connect, 
you've got a network that, that's quite possibly suspicious of laundering money. This can be applied to a broad variety of domains. So you can kind of transform queries, figure out which ones are significant, and then build a graph that's similar to the solution you're seeking, and then do simple graph analytics on it. All right, so what are we doing? ETL is hard, it's a bottleneck. So uh, we wanted to create classes that in, for your ontology that you transform data into, it validates them, it's a place to reuse code, and we need it to work with Spark. And so there's a project called Pydantic. So here you load the data, you've got movie awards, comedies, and horror, they all have different schemas, and it isn't a graph. Okay, you look at it, you come up with like, what's our ontology? There are movies, there are people, and there are awards, and some people directed movies, some acted in them, and some earned an award. Okay, that's our graph. All right, so here's how you might typically do ETL. You convert comedies and horror into your ontology movies. You've got a type of movie. The entity type is movie. Um, you know, it's a, the genre is comedy. Oops, that's why that code didn't work. And, um, you know, you've got horror movies transformed similarly. There's a project called Pydantic that provides runtime validation. So it'll initially you define types and it will verify that the schema matches, but you can add arbitrary validation here. So I added a UUID, you know, like, is it a valid UUID? Is it a valid phone number? And so you end up re-implementing this stuff when you do like raw ETL. This allows you to combine the validation because when you're combining like 10 data sets, you can run into ETL log jams where it's like, oh, there's this error and there's this error and you're trying to merge it all and it, it can get pretty hairy. So the idea with the this tool, uh, this, will be, this will be finished in like a week or two. Um, I was trying to get it done before this, but it's in progress. Um, but basically, uh, you the, the Pydantic Spark is a library that will produce uh, you know, PySpark schemas for these Pydantic classes. And so uh, you can see in this test, it's like looking at what the structure should be and what the schema should be. And then um, you define in this case, like the classes as you might, you know, in an ORM system for the the nodes and edges. And then you kind of create a, UD, a user defined function that just instantiates that class and all the transformation just kind of happens in one place. You could use this movie class for a bunch of different data sets. It's a way to bring all the, the transformations together, validate in one place and build like a single class that can handle varied input data. And this is kind of the thing we decided would, would, would you know address a lot of the issues we ran into. The other problem is uh, there needs to be a generic entity resolution system using some of the technologies I talked about. So I got to wrap up, but um, you know, Pydantic provides uh, enough metadata that you can generate one of those text documents from it and then apply the ditto type algorithm to it. We're actually using uh, graphical networks to do it and um, developing like an open entity resolution system that will work for, for kind of any type of graph data. Um, Motif search doesn't scale. Um, so I talked about using neural subgraph matching. That's a, another problem we're working on, uh, kind of laying out the method there. There is code for this paper as well. It's just a question of scaling it beyond, you know, like a, a couple million nodes to like a, a, a larger data set, but it's essentially a vector uh, search at that point. Uh, this is, you know, from the paper. It's from a professor named Yuri Leskovic at Stanford. Um, Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the step that we're working on and, and hopefully the overview of the problems you run into was educational and I earned my keep for uh, promoting the project. So, um, you know, we're uh, recruiting to work on this thing. Uh, I'm personally working on the um, ETL stuff, uh, you know, day by day. Uh, others are working on that, that entity resolution and the um, motif search. But, um, you know, if, if you're interested in it, check out the, uh, Slides, I'm still getting the website up. There's a GitHub repo and a PyPy package, um, and it's uh, coming along. So uh, thank you.